absolutely the most uh, difficult trade to do. So, uh, sorry, just blocked my thing here. Okay, now I can see. Um, you don't want to trade the third meeting. You just don't. It, it is, it is, it's, that's why I always say when it's there that I'm doing it, but I haven't given you guys of how to do it because it is just too volatile. It is, it is psychologically really difficult to do. As much as you see each time the same pattern to be arising, it is just very, very difficult to do. But like any abnormality, which is, would be an open or a close of a session of an exchange, it's an announced abnormality. So look at that uh, Bitcoin uh, chart prior to this thing. Can you, can you make those purple lines a little longer and stretch this thing a little apart? So what's really sexy on today is you know there is this abnormality that's coming. Move that whole chart a little bit to the left so we see the whole day. Good. And this one to the green, exactly, perfect. Just to the green bar. One left, here we go. And on the bottom, the same thing. Um, okay, perfect. So what I'm trying to say is, Matthew makes a call, and he's he's so humble. He's each time saying, well, we don't want to assume in hindsight. No, he can't assume in hindsight. The daily calls are really good. So people in Europe can totally trade this. When we have a sideways call, and yes, sometimes there might be a preference if we're in a directional movement uh, on larger time frames, but generally when we have a sideways call, it's shorter double drops, and go long the double bottoms. Now, obviously, it's uh, previous to any kind of exchanges open at the beginning, these first few bars, but we see the tops forming. So whether you short on the fourth daily bar, uh, hourly bar, or on the fifth with a doji, or on the sixth, doesn't matter. That's a winner. And you get out on the double bottom. Maybe you're financed before, but you, it's it's Fed Day. Nobody is pushing this because nobody is knows where this goes. You have a really high probability sideways day. So you go long on the double bottom. That would be that second touch, basically the longest low bar that we have. When it's a it goes down with action reaction, and you go long. And it goes all the way up to that final last green bar. And you don't hold any uh, any runners. But this is the classic case where you, it's the only exception where you don't want to hold any runners because on a Fed day there will be always a fading of a of a large move in, in both directions, so they will always get stopped out. But you can make a really nice one short, uh, one long, and you can even short uh, well one short one long. And they have really high probability. And we're talking here three, whatever, 360 to uh, 540. So you have a nice uh, 180 points on whatever, something like an 87% hit rate. That's the trades on this day. Forget about that Fed play. That Fed play is just, I mean, just imagine if we can, we, can we see the uh, ES chart 60 minutes? Thank you. So this is a range uh, 3900 to 37, whatever, 80. Um, do you know what kind of size this is? Only on a quad of, of, of just like that. That's basically your, your possibility of, uh, of a loss. Why would you trade that? There's no need to trade that if you're not completely like if this is basically not bonus round because you consistent like really well so um i just wanted to underline that there is no need to be so humble i wanted to basically be more aggressive of saying trade the daily calls on these days up until this thing and then exactly how i said 30 minutes before 
because these crazy guys, uh, I think the longest was one seventeen minutes early. I don't know uh, how they followed this up, but don't rely that this goes exactly to the time because sometimes uh, they're a little bit early and it can totally screw up your training. So no need to. This thirty minute rule is very good. Thirty minutes before and after. You shouldn't really say after thirty minutes because. As today, we have the 11 o'clock and then we have 11.30, we have the talk. So the rest of the day is basically fat day. So you trade, you trade till 30 minutes before and that was it. That was your day. But it is a really nice day because uh, you can, uh, with a good day, they call make very nice predictions and they're supported to this abnormality because the market is basically not acting right, just like it doesn't act right uh, liquidity when the market opens or when the market closes. And these these events uh, are always very um, interestingly affecting the rest of the day. So you can, as traders, for example, who systems that measure nothing else, what happens in the 30 minutes of the years, and then everything is based on uh, how to react to that. Uh, or a runner behavior, since I made that post yesterday where I made descriptions about um, financing, uh, and I, uh, in the fine tuning I wrote uh, abnormalities, um, you can totally tell the potentiality of a runner if you hold a runner into the last 30 minutes on a Friday. So you can stack odds where you say, well, what time of the day it is, or, which is 30 minutes before the close on Friday, what time of the week it is, uh, it's a Friday. Well, if you add whatever, it's, if this is Friday is like it was last Friday when we knew this would be the end of the month, um, more and more and more, you, you, you're basically stacking your cards into your favor. Um, that's why I mentioned all these different little edges that you, that you can consider into these things. Um, because these, in brackets, abnormalities uh, can help you. So, for example, fading moves like we had today, fading tops and fading lows on Bitcoin, uh, is also something uh, that has a lot higher probability uh, in the overnight session because it's less liquid, and you already know that that the computers will basically fade every, everything that shows a little bit of action, um, with the exception of precious metals. Um, that's why we trade them sometimes when the when the market closes, uh, or your, Europe is basically uh, early opening. But um, it's re it's really important to just leave the risky stuff out and uh, ante up on the on the low risk stuff when the when the ads are bigger. And uh, as I said, don't don't wait for whatever one of the traders to wake up and, and make their trades. And these calls are valid. I. I trade small size, even with limit orders. Uh, I go to bed, I know this is a high probability on my daily call, I shut the double top, yeah, because if I go whatever at an hour, let's say I go at, at, at midnight or one o'clock to bed when I saw the two opens of uh, the Brits and, and Europe, uh, and I have that first high or low even, it's a sideways call, and I place, I place a limit order with, with a, uh, OCO or conditional order that, that, that I get my stops behind and go to bed. In the morning I wake up like, ah, great. Uh, oh, I got stopped out. So um, that's it. So this was very, very valuable of what Matthew said there because um, what to know what not to do and to know what not to trade and to know when to stay out of the market is risk control, and risk control is, uh, in, in my credo, literally the, the only really important thing. The rest will automatically fall into place, but if you don't have uh, great risk control that, like Matthew has, then uh, it just takes you longer to get to anywhere. Thank you, Matthew, for letting me in. Yeah, thanks for that, Kobe. Ross just entered the room. Um, yeah, just to recap on that, <clears throat> you know, we don't have to catch every single move. This FOMO, um, uh, patience really is the key to this. And, and when uh, Kobe mentioned before that once the market reading skills are down, this could be 99% psychology. So 
the cultivating patience is super important. And just to, just to show you how um, you don't have to have a major winner on every single day and not everything has to be a home one home run. And this was a good example of how this, the right before the fed meeting, this is not a good time to hold a runner. I mean, just think about this. It's like, even if you were hitting that pure sideways day and it's like, okay, these things have a high hit rate, but like what we said that shorting the double top when he doesn't even watch it overnight, even that has a high hit rate. I think it was like in the high seventies. Now, just imagine this. It's like, if you really, if you really had a discipline, you could really have a 40% accuracy and have a two to one reward to risk. And you could still technically be profitable over a large number of trades. I mean, that's how, that's how, uh, powerful risk control is in combining accuracy with risk reward. Now, I think psychologically having 40% hit rate would be really, really hard for people, but there are traders that trend traders or whatever you can read about the market wizards, they would have that hit rate. But I think that just, just to show you how there's different psychologies for this expectancy expression, and there's different ways and combinations of it that can lead to uh, consistent profitability. So there's many ways there, even, even within this strategy of reward to risk and accuracy. But uh, just uh, go going to the example, the, the call for ES was uncertain. So even so, I felt the impulse that, hey, you know, there's a, this is the first time if we went to the AD line, that when we touched this, there was a huge momentum shift. So when it popped back up, my energy was like, you know, go in. I'm like, well, that's why I'm hitting reply to my call. I said, listen, the following my call just actually felt better than doing this impulsive trade because top down, like I said, I've kept track of this stuff and that's why your stats are so important. It works out more than not over the long, over the long run. And that's why when this came back, now eventually this went up first, I didn't really FOMO into this because I'm happy that I took what I thought. Now this wasn't a home run trades when you mean, but it was a low risk trade. It was a planned out sideways chop in the overnight uh, before a Fed meeting where the sideways had a clear entry and I think I got out actually more than it was half of a runner. So it was 12 and a half percent left before it stopped out now. But also it's like when we say there's an eight point tick and uh, for the ES and less than 1% on average, it doesn't mean that you have to max out on this 2% risk rule. Like every trade has to be 2% or 1%. If it's, if it's, if it's smaller in validation point, you could see on the, uh, the Bitcoin trade today, if you go back what I posted in the channel, I think it was like anywhere from 40 to 50 ticks or something like this. Because the low, for, for, for my two cents, I was willing to say, okay, the low of the day does not have to be below my zone. It was, it was below these lows and this confluence of yesterday's lows. If, I, if it came to here, that's another story. I'm not willing to take that big of a stop. And because I'm managing invalidation points and thinking where my risk reward is and where my, where my profile is, I can apply the daily call in real time and be more adherent to it because the, the difficult thing is uh, sticking to your plan more often than not. Now, there may be a level where initially your plans are not correct because you need to work on your market reading skills. So that's where there needs to be a balance of also taking in, you know, uh, the real time situation as well. Because you know, remember, the daily call is a snapshot in time at that moment in time. But what it does is it takes away a lot of the misreads in the in the intraday that a lot of amateur traders get thrown off with. So you have to have a fine balance of the two especially when things are neutral back and forth. That's why it's like, even though I have these zones, I'm using the real price action to get in. I think a question that Thomas had, uh, if he's here, no, he's not here today. He had, it's like, well, when do you use, you know, you're drawing zones, Kobe's not drawing zones. When are you using your double bottoms and price? Or when do you fade up for, when do you get in on a zone or when would you get into the price pattern? And like I said, that really depends on the con. So today it's like, I didn't really need to see any overshoot or anything big to get in on this overnight choppy sideways session, which there was one entry in the morning real time. But the thing is, is that this entry was easier to me because it had a clear, clear risk. I have a note on my desk that says, think about your stop and target first. Now the old me would have said, why didn't I, uh, you know, you know, stick around for this volatility in the news. I had, this is a zone. I could have waited for it to go up there and look at this huge moves I could have missed. I could have chased. I could have maybe saw some, I could have, you know, that's, that's the old me. That's not the, that's, that's a guy that is not patient and doesn't let the trades come to him because that's the guy that was trying to make money every day out of greed or whatever, trying to prove something rather than the new me, which comes to the market in order to reflect an optimal state of mind so I can file correct process. And that's when these things are more coming to me and the, the validation points are clear. Can I, can I 
jump in with a little yeah. commentary. Um, what's actually not known, what I never wrote anywhere, but we're a small group here. And we, I don't believe in secrets, but what, so I, 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 I gladly want to share with this group is how the daily call got developed was that even so I knew all from from endless courses and endless for whatever I, I had spent at the time a quarter million of my money that I didn't have on education, thinking education is the way to God, I was wrong. Um, I mean, but if you have education, the PPT room, but if you buy it, just if you think if you just go to every course and every mentor and every whatever, that's not getting you to success. But this one was a, a truth, which is. Um, don't have losing streaks. Uh, okay, don't have losing streaks. So how does that work? Uh, how do I not have a losing streak? I'll have a rule that if you have two and three losers in a row, you don't train any longer. Uh, okay. We'll have another three losers in a row, and we'll have another three losers in a row. And it, 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 okay, I just, it, this is just not good enough. Because when do I start again? And how do I control that? Because you get in these emotional states. And, um, and the daily call was my attempt to find a way to, on the prior day, make sure that I don't have more than three losers in a row. Now, what's not so obvious, but if you give it the time for yourself or you just trust me, whatever is, is your fancy, you will see that no matter what call you make out of the, I think the regular is six or seven. I have a little bit more calls, that's why it's, um, but I think what what they're doing is seven calls sideways, to, uh, no, seven, uh, six calls. Um, you cannot have losers in a row, no matter what the work is doing. So there is a second secret sauce, so to say, in the daily call, which is, it's automatically built that way, that if you follow the daily call, even if you're dead wrong with it, you might say sideways and it becomes a super trend day. You might say uh, it's a super trend day and it becomes a super trend day in the other direction. However you use this call, if you just follow these rules of what not to do, and this is what the daily call is mainly for, it's not an instruction of what to do, it's an instruction of what not to do. You will not have a series of losing trades. That's just how it's built. Uh, no, I don't want to steal too much time of Matthew's presentation, but you, you can just go through the scenarios yourself uh, of uh, all the dead wrong ones, and you will find out, oh, well, that's true. And this is the biggest problem for every trader, because let's say it's a trend down day. And uh, you didn't know in the morning, so on the first time of water, you went long because whatever. Now I have a loser because it's standing down, so it broke. Now I have one loser. And the typical thing is that people don't know how to short, like or how to get into a short that's already on its way. And if it's a trend day, you literally cannot get in. Besides very poor tools like breaker tools or something like this that are just awful. Um, so what you do because you see it move, you all the time think, well, this I'll I'll catch it when it when it's over. And you end up sitting at the end of the day in front of a trade down day, and you went five or seven times long. And you just say, why why, why did I not just go short? Well, because the only subconscious opportunity that was left is going long because you didn't have a tool set for entering into this thing. And after all, that's where the fades are, that's where the whatever in the dog rooms you get, maybe a sideways day. It looks attractive to go long on a down day. It really does, especially emotionally, because it always comes to you. And if it's a creep day, it's a really bad. You might have 10 losers because it literally feels emotionally all the time. Oh, this is over here, now it will turn. Oh, this is over here, now it will turn. And this is the real demoralizing thing about trading is when you 
when you have a wide range day, a trend day, uh, and you will all the time on, your, on the wrong side. And this is where typically beginning traders and even whatever, fairly down the road a few years, get creamed. And it hits you emotionally, it hits your equity curve. It is just devastating because uh, then comes at some point, I want my money back and then just to break even or, or the next day or whatever. And this, if this happens on the Monday, literally, you're, you're right around there to, to have this being the week where you blow your account. Um, so the daily call uh, is actually a really cool mystery tool in that way. And however you apply it, and that's why I employ everybody to create their own daily call, which is nothing else than measuring the previous day with all the tool sets that you use, your edges, your technical analysis, your whatever, uh, to, to make an educated guess what's the most likelihood for tomorrow to be happening. And it's a practice thing. It's, it's, it's over time you get better at this. Uh, besides that, we will also teach you more refined tools for daily calling uh, at PPT throughout time. But uh, what I'm trying to say is if you employ it, and even if you make the worst call for the next day, if you follow your daily call, you will not end up having a series of losers at the next session. And if you don't, if you don't get devastated, because you know, it's okay to have two or three losers in a row, everybody has two or three losers in a row, that's just normal. Then you can come in the next day again with a fresh, healthy mindset. You don't have these brutal, oh, now I have to stop and for two weeks hit the trade and go whatever, because it's a protection tool, most and foremost. And uh, that just chimes right into what Matthew is explaining today. He, he learned the value of, of the daily call, makes amazing daily calls himself now, and just adheres to them. And says, yeah, well, I don't care that it's set tomorrow. Or I don't care that the daily call is uncertain that I'm not allowed to trade, because that's not that easy. If you're an interday trader and you have to sit there, uh, because uh, it's not like one where the whole market is uh, uncertain and you can go to the beach, but Bitcoin is uh, where he made the absolute awesome call of sideways, which is exactly fulfilled. Um, you sit there and you see these opportunities on the ES and you say like, oh, but I cannot trade it now because I made that call. But he does that. And this is why his equity curve it looks exactly the way you want it to look. Um, so, just wanted to add this to what he's saying because it, he always puts this. I'm, I'm, I'm making this almost dramatic and five times repeat and whatever. I'm a babbler, uh, while he he makes it look very easy and, and, and understated. As I felt like it's it's really important to tell that what comes across like yeah, he traded a little here, a little trade a little here. And this is very sophisticated stuff that he's doing, and it's 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 amazing with what discipline he just stay, stays away. Sometimes he points out that if you would have that call, then you have it here, but he's just not touching the stuff, and that's that's really the big big part in trading is just don't do it if you don't feel comfortable. Don't do it if it's if it's not in your arsenal. Don't do it if the daily trade that you made says don't do it. Just like that's that's the discipline that that's in brackets easy because everybody always says, yeah, well, uh, keep your losses short and let your winners run. Uh, it's not a rule that anybody can follow. If you're talking about fight flight mechanisms to overrule, but to say um, I won't I won't cheat on my own daily call, that's a discipline that you can condition and employ. Uh, and Matthew is really great at that. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I, I uh, something you said. I just there's such a good example of it about how uh, the daily call can help you from a series of losses. Like this was a, this was in hindsight. I was just looking. I'm like, man, this was just not a good trade, right? But I forget. I think I made a sideways up call, and I was just obsessed with this creep market. And of course, there was a part of me that says, well, if I made a sideways, that's a perfect short quick stop. I said, nope, that's my that's my sideways up call. Now, technically, the next real after this move happened, right? And this this thing didn't get the breakup. This was the next entry point if I decided to take it. I made this mistake, which was this, this oh discretionary row where I, I was giving way too much weight 
to the uh, market internals when the mistake that I made is I was like, Matt, two days ago, I had this zone. This was a thick green zone. This was a major zone if we zoom out. So I should have waited the major zone trade location higher because we were coming down from that breaking the structure. But still, I took this way, but still... I said this was a one hour loss, but because I took it at the back of the zone, this was actually four points. And, you know, I was wrong. The call was invalidated. Now, sideways up was the call. This was the new low. This happened so fast. This is, or actually, if we go in the smaller time frame, this is an hour. But even so, in an hour, I mean, this took the entire overnight session, and this was right at eight. And then in one candle, two, two hours, we took out all that market structure. So clearly, if I made a sideways up call on this day, which I believe I did, then my call's invalidated. So I'm not looking to go. It protects you from uh, going short, uh, buying here, buying here, buying, you know, all the way down, getting smashed. And that that's what was so important. So I said, OK, it doesn't feel good to take a loss on a call, which I didn't feel was right. And also, I gave this one in front of folks. So the thing is, OK, what I said, OK, now that I have that feeling, I said, OK, welcome to the feeling. I said, I, this is hard. Mistakes are going to happen. And what was good about this day? So in the sheets, it's like just finding your journal. It's like what was good about this is at least I took a one hour loss. There wasn't a five trades after this revenge trading in front of everyone, in front of myself, trying to get it back. Because that can happen. When that fight or flight happens, you will say, wow, why did I not pass my test of knowing my system when I could pass it as a book learning thing if it was a written test in school or something? But if when I apply it in real time, when the things when the, when the heat's on, it's because like Corby said, that fight or flight will override. But that's what that call does. Even when you're wrong, that protective mechanism can stop you from making mistakes. And the instinct was like, okay, well, this is initial support. Why this was the better one? I said, listen, my call's wrong. I'm not getting in again. That was it. The momentum was wrong. It broke down. The idea of this of this um, bigger picture trend continuation pattern. One of the mistakes that I made, I noticed I made this twice, is that there may have been a trend continuation pattern if we zoom out, but really getting um, long here in anticipation of a trend continuation breakout through this major zone, which I should have. It was green. I think when I made it blue in my mind, I forgot or whatever it was, I just somehow, when I saw the internals, fight or flight took over and I gave more weight on a bounce to that. As soon as I got in, it felt heavy. And I said, man, this is up at two or one or two points. I think I should just get out. And then before I could, I just went down. Now, there's always, there's always a say, okay, I follow my system. That's what great traders do. Or, or was this a situation where great traders quickly recover from mistakes? And uh, I'm a great trader. This was buying this aggressively. This was, this was a mistake. Obviously, the location was in the middle of this thing. And even though this was a creep up, we would need, you know, breaking above here and then breaking down. So when it opened on this, if we go right at 930, I, I know in, in the channel, if you Google, uh, not Google, if you go to the search bar, uh, you will you can see something called an open drive. Now, it has to be in the right context, but it's like it's, this was the opposite of that when the market opened and we saw this and then we broke down within the first, you know, ideally I'd like it in within 10 minutes, but this was on the uh, 45th minute. Uh, but the thing is, this is an open drive down. So that's another thing I should have. I'm not saying I had to like go with this and, and trade this breakdown or whatever. But the idea is that, hey, if, this, if I if I if I trade open drive up in the right context, like I did in the channels of POI as a as a to get on board in a class B way when I got out of the double bottom too early, then this open drive down should at least make me not go in. You know what I mean? And that was right around the open. That was another thing. A big move right at the open. Either way, be careful especially if you're coming from this major zone. Um, yeah, and then today was uncertain. So uh, I wrote in the chat if anyone had any questions and no one had. So we have Haro, Ross, Miros, and Kobe. So yeah, that's, that's kind of what I wanted to say, Ross. If you had any questions about... Uh, Anything I just said regarding Bitcoin, Bitcoin was a lot easier to trade. It was just, it was a sideways call. The idea was that at least the overnight, it's saying the overnight has low volume and it was before this Fed meeting. And there's like this principle that things don't get really volatile until around a Fed meeting that it would be really easy to get just, you know, double tops, double bottoms, double bottoms. You literally could stay up all night 
you know, and, and this is the one situation, like Corey said, it's like, we're not stacking runners on a fed day because it's like the whipsaw back to both sides can be, this was like a super crazy, uh, uh, you know, whipping to both sides of, of, of this, at this point, it was just pure sideways, clear ranges, and then boom, boom, boom. So at this point in time, before the fed meeting, it's like pretty much get out of all your trade or scale significantly. And that's what I did. I, I scaled, uh, everything but 12 and a half percent of my Bitcoin position at this pop into here, maybe it would go up to here, but then around the fed meeting whipsaw to both sides stopped out at original level, which was still tight because it was just a few ticks lower than this low. And that was that I, I, even though this volatility can make one say, Hey man, why didn't we get up here? But it's all hindsight. I'm happy not, you know, getting destroyed uh in between seeing the hindsight bias of where this thing actually uh, ended and just following that rule eventually i will i will try to uh incorporate news-based items but right now the rule for me is i just i just stay out of the market 30 minutes before and 30 minutes after and it's not a bad uh rule to be in place because if you have an abundance mindset and you're not fomoing then you're you're thinking hey i don't want to be involved in this because yeah, there's like great movements and traders want movements, but I usually could have been stopped out before I caught something or nothing. All right, guys. Well, I'll just uh, I'll just quickly wrap up here. Um, you know, just one of the things that I was talking about with my own issues is that, you know, sometimes after we have a big old move and, you know, maybe going into the next day, now this day, you know, consolidating, it would be hard for me to maybe stay up and plan at three to five in the morning, maybe a double top to go short. But after a big move and you see the price action, you know, that was probably the easiest day, you know, trade of the day, if you were going to make a sideways call or something on a day like this on sideways, when I was uncertain, probably because of the Fed meeting. But the idea is that only around this time does it really get crazy, which it got pretty crazy in all markets. Um, I don't even know what the guy said. Does anyone know? Did he say? Yeah, cool. I'll tell him, Ross. Yeah, I don't know if, what did he say, if he lowered, pivoted, this, that, but the idea is I don't care whatever they're betting on. I don't know. You know, um, sometimes it's not linear. It's just whipsaw. So I'm just out now going into tomorrow. We finally got, you know, we had those multiple narrow range days where we but finally broke. Uh, there was good odds that the overnight was going to consolidate and that it was going to break tomorrow and that it was going to uh, break or at least extend around that news time. And if it didn't, that would be even greater odds that it would break tomorrow. Now we got the break. Now going into tomorrow, you know, the question is, is that is this sort of balanced breakout area where we now we have this double bottom price action with these lows on uh, Friday's uh, lows before we moved up here and kind of confirmed this breakout spot. Is that going to hold or, or are we going to do some type of gap suction now? And then this will bounce around here and we'll go back down and, and test this moving average. I don't know. But uh, just on first test, right? Um, you know, you can see that even if you're on the wrong side of the market, let's just go to the ES, not that I encouraged it, but even if you were on the wrong side of the market, like, like today, for instance, if you bought here overall, if you waited to the mid of the back of the zone, you know, you at least got good trade location. Now I'm not encouraging that because it's just a way harder game. To fade against the trend we want to go with the trend but it's just the idea that if you don't know which side is going to be trending on and there's a lot of things not aligned on your side then it's then that's when you wait patiently uh for good trade location to the middle to the back of the zone preferably with your stop if you can at the next zone if it's possible if it's not too wide the closer the better and but if things are lining on your side and it's and, and, and then you can get in at the top to the middle and even front run the zone because it may be building a uh, top building ahead of time. So it's, it's all contextual, right? All right, guys. Well, that's pretty much a wrap for today. Uh, thanks for coming out. Um, I'll be doing the analysis for uh, the ES coming up and uh, Bitcoin later on. But uh, as this thing works itself out, right? The question is, is this going to continue to balance, right? Or is it going to be a breakdown? And we'll see pretty much how this closed. What we're seeing now in the CCI, the, just as one other factor to see whether this is oversold or not, right, is that there is going to be some separation here. And this is setting up to at least be tomorrow a short-term uh, responsive buying zone where buyers could be active here. You know, it's like one, two, three, four red days. This is not a bad place to possibly... Uh, 
go long. Now we'll see. Now, if it breaks this, right, that's a bounce breakdown pattern, at least in the weak time frame. And then that would sort of bring this whole thing into question. And then the gap suction would bring us, dog leash would bring us down to these moving averages, right? Now for ES, just going with different scenarios, right? The uh, the bounce breakout scenario that I had in mind, envisioned didn't happen. Um, when we had this dragonfly doji, probably I should have had the heads up here. This is one of the things that I'm working on with Corby's that I'm really good on the on the when the intermediate time frame is turning and, and being the first to catch the low because I'm naturally just a positive person in psychology. And then I'm really good riding this up. And then when we have one leg, two leg, three leg up, four leg, one leg up, two leg up, three, almost four legs up now, we're coming up now into this intermediate time frame where, where I should be neutral to neutral, possibly even turning point bear. It's hard for me now to go short. So I usually just go uncertain to sideways. And that's just my thing, right? You know, we all got our things to work on. You can see if I did see that, if I did have the, to, to stay up the motivation to go short really is, am i going to stay up all night because it just seems to be lately the rotation happens on the short side because i'm on the eastern time uh when i'm sleeping so i miss some of it but that's that's all right remember we're doing this right now as a small group during you know a pretty tricky market as you can see this was up down back forth you know looks like it's breaking down then goes up then goes up and, you know we have a pure steep up market like with, when bitcoin resumes during uh let's just say a year from now, the having. I mean, look how easy it is these markets are. We just have steep up markets, right? And, and then if there is a major pullback, anytime it does pull back into a major zone in the context of the uptrend, you know, the, the major pattern resumes itself. And, and But that's just not the market we're in right now. But it's not a bad market to learn in. You know, we have this balance breakout pattern. We got some movement. We, now, we went 100% of this fractal. Remember, the markets are fractal. So this was a good target. Uh, for your lower time frame trades, for some reason it's not letting me out to move that. Yeah, I'm trying to show you that that was about 100% of the range, but it's not letting me move it for some reason. I think it's because I'm sharing my screen. But um, yeah, so that that's that's what's going down for tomorrow, guys. So that's it, man. Um, thanks for coming out. Um, Harold and Ross, um, Ross too. Ross, uh, we got to set up a one-on-one -on -one too, man. And Harold, DM me, guys. Um, you know. Uh, usually on Fridays when there's office hours because the markets are quieter. So I'm not as positioned. So I usually just hang that green sign and people that DM me, I set it up. But um, if you're free anytime Friday or whatever, um, send me a DM this week and we'll set up the one-on-ones and then I can go um, deeper into this. Just so you know, I have a whole sheet on this stuff. Like if I type in here CCI, especially for more so for the ES than Bitcoin, you see how we're at these moving averages and there's this low volume node and this blue line, this turbo hit that purple line reject and then we had i'm sorry the cc blue line hit the tur the purple line reject but the turbo yellow went way over that's a zero line reject so the aka pause slash possible reversal day so uh not, not that i want us to overweight this indicator but that is a category in the day of the call so all right guys um thanks for coming out and uh yes i do need and i will great hero is that a lagging indicator um Oh God, ladding and leading. Yes, I think it is because it, it's just it's it's just showing an it's an oscillator that's showing momentum extremes, right? And I think to lead it has to be sort of like a derivative. You have to get something from options from the VIX indicator because at least it's pointing towards the future. Yep. All right, Hero. We'll talk soon. Thanks, Ross. We'll talk in our um, one-on-ones, guys. Take care now and uh, have a great day. Peace.